So riffing on Mark Twain, reports of Moore's Law's demise have been greatly exaggerated. Um, these are predictions about when it would end. So here I am standing in front of you saying the end of Moore's Law. Um, and these are the end dates. This is from The Economist. Um, and most interesting for you guys at the back is most of the predictions of when Moore's Law will end have come from Gordon Moore. Um, <laughs> here he is, 2015, still saying it ain't going to last. Um, but actually, there's sort of a, um, there's sort of a con consensus arising that it has to end in about 10 years. Because we just know where the roadmap takes us. We know the size of silicon. This is physics, guys. Except for these guys. I don't know where they are. Lawrence Krauss, he's a professor. Case Western and Ken St Glenn Starkman at CERN said approximately 2,600. <laughs> Where will you be in the year 2600? <laughs> um, but at any rate, there, there's an obvious consensus coming up now. And Gordon Moore has been really lively in this field forever. He's really a giant in any way possible. So now let me flip the page just slightly and talk about what's the impact. So Moore's law to me is not about scaling of transistors. It's a statement of productivity, of economic productivity. Almost, and I'll, I'll talk about that in, in a little bit of detail. But this just shows the chip, uh, sort of the electronic equipment market globally. It's six, $1.6 trillion. And that is only the tip of the iceberg. Because it neglects the size of dependent markets. <coughs> um, without electronics, there's no internet. There's no Amazon, Google, Facebook, Microsoft, Adobe. Airline travel, look around you. There ain't much. Electronics fab equipment makers, chemical suppliers, the whole value chain, which is enormous. It extends throughout the globe to support this $1.6 trillion basic business. And if you look on the S&P, most companies on the S&P don't exist without Moore's Law. It's our economy, folks. That's what it is. And so the Moore's Law scaling is an increase in productivity year on year that is enabled by more and more computational capability. So it's the driver of the economy. So if that stops, head for the hills. So here's some electron economics. I just compiled this, um, also off the web. This is my chart. Um, company, it's market cap in billions. Tell me if you see something wrong with this picture. The chip markets, their SAM or, or, or sector available market, $250 billion, $350 billion. These are the market caps of the three um, market leaders in chip manufacturing around the world. Samsung, Intel, which is the biggest, and TSMC in Taiwan. Uh, <coughs> uh, $150 billion. Then, of course, my beloved group, which is chip manufacturing. Not all of them are my beloved because, you know, I, I'm true blue loyal to applied materials. 35 billion, it's a tenth. So just making the stuff that makes chips is a tenth the size of the chip makers. But then you get to the chip users, and there's no limit. 660 billion for Apple. Google, Where, what's Google without a chip? It doesn't exist. 520. If we stop, what happens to Google? That's the point, right? If, if the people who are engineering the devices and inventing the materials stop in their progress, this whole thing starts to collapse. Not that it's self-centered. Um, <laughs> Moore's law is therefore equal to economic productivity. Just to give you some sense of how big a share of our economy is um, in just the chip the semiconductor equipment, uh, or the semi, I gotta be careful when I say uh, semiconductor equipment because that applies, people like applied materials, but I'm talking about all the semiconductor widgets we have. The share of electronic manufacturing as a fraction of GDP, for Taiwan, it's 15% of their economy. For the US, which is not a big, you know, proportionally manufacturing economy, it's 5.5%. And, 
and you, and you can see that Korea and Taiwan and China are really huge semiconductor manufacturing. But when you look at global market share of who owns this field, it's us. At 44% of global market share is in the US, comes from the US. So as the transistor shrinks and their density increases, so does computational capability. As this capability increases, so do customers and markets. This has been a true proven trend for 50 years and more. And that's why Moore's law equals economic productivity. But there's that problem of going from 20 million transistors to 19 transistors, 19 million transistors per dollar. It's hard. Making large circuits with nanoscale precision is expensive. So I've just pulled this again off the web. It's kind of the cost of doing business. If you want to start a wafer fab, the next generation for wafers, is 300 millimeters. People are pretty skeptical whether we'll go to 450, but 450 nanometers is the next step. A, fabric, a fab is where we make these circuits, $10 billion plus. Okay, that is, you know, you can collect by 90% of the companies in the country and you won't get to $90 billion of usable income that year. But you know, if you want to do a 10 nanometer fab, in addition to that, it's $10 billion. If you want to do it, so that's the next node, 20 nanometer fab is four to $7 billion. That's what these companies are outlaying. So you can see this is only for the companies with a strong stomach and a big billfold. So I like, this is kind of what my brain has done for me. From the year 1970 to 2000, Moore's Law was a liberation. It was like this new world that we all entered into of ideas and businesses. And out of this came thousands of businesses and millions of ideas. After 2000, Moore's Law became an, unrelent, uh, an unrelenting slave driver, focusing the last standing companies, the largest ones, on maintaining or eking out small bits of market share. You go up a point of market share, you sell little chips that maybe Intel sells now Samsung does it, you can win, and that may be the end of Samsung. <clears throat> to launch a chip today costs a new chip with a new design, costs over $100 million. Six or seven years ago, it was, what, 30, 20 to 30 million.